I was born in Edgewick, which is an area in the English city of Coventry, and I grew up in the 1970s. Like most kids lucky enough to have their grandparents still knocking about, they were two of my favorite people in the whole wide world. My granddad was a fantastic bloke and taught me to fish and shoot pellet guns, but my nana was an absolute saint. She always had a tray of gingerbread men ready whenever we went round for tea, and she made the best roast potatoes I've ever had, even all these years later. And almost everywhere she went, people would stop her to say hello or would simply say something nice as they walked past her in the street. As a young lad, I didn't really know any better. I just thought Nana was as popular with everyone else as she was with me. But they didn't love her because she made good roasties or baked a cracking apple pie. They loved her for a very different reason. As I learned later on in life, my Nana was a popular and rather famous figure in Coventry because she served as an air raid warden during the Second World War. I imagine not many of your American listeners will know what one of those is, so if you'll excuse a slight diversion, let me explain. During the war, every fit fighting age man was sent off to the army or what have you, meaning women had to take their places in jobs they wouldn't be traditionally expected to do. You had lady police officers, firewomen, ladies digging through the rubble of bomb sites and helping to rebuild essential infrastructure. And in the case of my Nana, you had lady air raid wardens too. When German aeroplanes started dropping bombs on us, the air raid wardens would go around to make sure everyone was in their shelters. They also went around to make sure no lights were showing, as they did these full citywide blackouts back then to confuse German bombers. So if there were a crack in your curtains and your warden could see light coming from inside, They'd bang on the windows so hard that the glass would almost break, and that was your warning for the night. Anyway, that's what Nana did. Walked around all night making sure everyone stayed blacked out and all that. And anyway, one night Nana's doing her rounds when she hears a scream coming from a good few streets away. As you can imagine, the blackouts meant that the nights back then were deathly quiet, so Nana could hear the scream from quite a distance away. As she was running to investigate, she bumped into another air raid warden, a bloke this time, and as they reached the area they suspected the scream to have come from, they started looking around to locate the source of it. Minutes later, they find her, a young woman, stabbed almost to death in an alleyway. The young woman was rushed to the hospital, and she survived her wounds, but everyone agreed that she'd been very, very fortunate to do so. She claimed her attacker had been a very nondescript working-class gentleman wearing an overcoat and cap. They also discovered that the woman was a prostitute, or rather, she wouldn't admit to being one, but there was very little other reason why a woman would be all dressed up and out on her own like that, especially when there was a bloody war going on. She was never about to admit it though, not even so much as to avoid arrest either because of the deep shame associated with it. But that being said, she wasn't the only one who attempted to defy the blackout regulations to ply her trade, and they ended up paying a very similar price. A few nights later, and Nana wasn't there to hear it happening this time, but another young lady was attacked in roughly that same area, just too far for Nana to hear it on her rounds. Again, the woman was suspected to be a prostitute, but sadly, she wasn't as fortunate as the first young lady. Her attacker seemed to have learned a lot from that first attempt, and on his second, he very literally went for the jugular. When all was said and done, the air raid wardens were scared that they had a sort of Coventry version of Jack the Ripper on their hands, and the timing of it was just bloody awful as well. The Germans were raining bombs from the sky, and as grim as it was, that brought a real sense of togetherness to the people suffering from it. So to think this bloke was, how to put it, battling against his own team in the middle of a war, it put the absolute fear of God into people. People said he was a German agent, some commando sent over to terrorize the people. He wasn't that at all as it turned out, but it gives you an idea of how frightened people were. Anyway, this carries on for a few more weeks until in the end, 
there were no more prostitutes walking the streets at all after sundown. But then, the psycho still wanted to satisfy his thirst for blood, so after having no luck on one of his hunts, he tries to break into the home of a woman he believed to be alone. Thankfully, the woman wasn't alone as her husband was in the bath upstairs and he chased the attacker away without a stitch of clothing on him, which probably added to the shock factor and scared the attacker off. The fact that no one was hurt was no doubt a good thing, but it was a very thin silver lining to a very dark sort of cloud because if this blackout ripper, as the people have taken to calling him, was willing to break into houses to find a victim, that it wasn't just prostitutes that were in danger. No one was safe. As you can imagine, people weren't happy. They thought the police should have caught the bloke after the first attack, but they'd let him commit two or three more attacks before he finally went for someone minding their own business in their own home. They were outraged, saying it never should have gotten that far in the first place, and they raised such a fuss that the local superintendent promised to beef up local patrols and hire more air raid wardens to watch the streets. But then, that was no good, was it? The police couldn't very well neglect other areas of the city for a prolonged period of time, and the Blackout Ripper avoided officers and wardens like the plague. And what's even worse, they couldn't let lady officers or patrol women out on their own, so they had to double up for safety meaning even though they'd brought in help from other areas of Coventry, it still wasn't enough to cover all the necessary ground. Then that night, when the patrols were supposed to be boosted and everything was supposed to be fine again, the Blackout Ripper struck again. Some of the prostitutes who had gotten word of the boosted patrols had decided to take their chances out in the street again, and for one of them, that proved a deadly mistake. That night's murder was the most savage yet, and it seemed only a matter of time before the Ripper decided to go kicking down doors again. Something had to be done, or rather, someone had to come up with a plan. And that's when my dear old Nana suggested something incredibly brave. That she would pose as a prostitute, to bait the man into trying to attack her, at which point she could blow very hard on a whistle to summon officers who would be waiting nearby. And you read that right, by the way. They didn't give her a gun, or a club, or anything else she could use to actually defend herself. The police gave her a tiny tin whistle, and then basically told her, Off you pop, go and catch us a murderer. I think it might have been a bit more of a sophisticated operation than that, but I remember feeling an acute sense of outrage when I found out that they wouldn't give her any kind of weapon. Granted, not even the police were armed with guns at the time and British police still patrol mostly unarmed, not counting your taser, baton, and CS spray. But back then, they had even less to work with if they wanted to subdue a criminal. But then, the officers standing by to catch the blackout ripper would be armed with batons. Nana had nothing but her wits, that bloody whistle, and a will to catch the monster that had been preying on the good people of Edgewick. And so one night... Nana makes her way down to the local police station to go over the plan one last time before heading off into the night. Then, down at the station, she dolls herself up in all her finest glad rags, slaps on a load of war paint, makeup that is, and then once all the officers are in their various hiding places, off she goes towards the Cap Martin Road, which was where she'd first pose as bait. She said she was walking up and down for hours, heels clacking on the pavement, but she didn't see so much as a soul, and after a while, Nana started to think that they wouldn't have any luck. Finally, she turned down the back street between Chevrolet Avenue and Grandmouth Road, and took a little wander down that, not realizing it was a dead end. She then turns back, only to see someone blocking her exit. The figure is about 50 feet down from her, but she knows it's not one of the policemen, because he's clearly not wearing that very distinct Bobby's helmet that they were all wearing. Nana said she called out to the man, and she could tell that it was a man by the way he was dressed, but that he didn't reply to her. Instead, he started walking down the back street towards her, at a brisk pace, still without saying a word. She sees him reach into his jacket and take something from a pocket, something which he fiddled with for a second before she saw the glint of a blade in the moonlight. 
Nana's hand went straight for her pocket, straight for that little whistle she'd been given. She knew that there were policemen just a street or two away, so blowing the whistle would have them there in seconds. But as she pulled it from her pocket, the tiny tin whistle got caught on a brass button and it slipped from her grasp. She thought she'd had it. There was no finding that whistle before the bloke reached her, but she's also sort of instinctually kneeled down to grab it back up off the floor. She said she was frozen in terror for a moment, convinced that she was about to die, when suddenly this wave of defiance rose up in her, and she whipped off one of her shoes and brandished it like a weapon. Nana said this ripper laughed and asked her, what are you planning on doing with that? But in reply she told him, and she didn't just say this either, she barked it so loud that people streets away heard her. My name is Warden Eileen Topsbury, and you're bloody well under arrest. That got another laugh from the bloke, and that one a little bit more nervous than the first, and then Nana started screaming something equally loud, things like, I'll have your bloody eye out with this heel if you come near me. And maybe that was a bit more fight than he was used to. But just for a moment, the Ripper hesitated, and the next thing Nana knows, she can see two bobbies coming bombing it around the corner, at full pelt, shouting, Oi, you, stop where you are. In that moment, Nana went from behind trapped in the back street with the blackout Ripper, to having successfully trapped him in with two approaching officers. The stroke of bad luck turned into a stroke of good luck in a matter of a few moments, and it's a bloody good job, too. My mom hadn't been born yet, so if Nana was murdered, there's no mom, no me, and none of my kids either. Since he knew he was boxed in, the Ripper tried to scale a wall to get away, but it was too late for him. The two bobbies grabbed him by the leg, brought him down, and then beat the living shite out of him before they dragged him off to the police station. After that, Nana was a hero. We still got the newspaper clipping from that time too, and she was intensely proud of them, right up until the day she passed away. She was a bit loopy towards the end too, started losing her memory and all of that, but she never, ever forgot the night that she saved Edgewick from the blackout Ripper. If you put a gun to my head and told me that if I didn't tell you the craziest true story you'd ever heard, you'd blow my head off, I'd tell you this one. I used to be an undercover cop here in DC and my cover was being a street junkie. I was good at it too, did three full stints before they killed off my character, as you could say, and part of the reason I was so good was no different from what makes an Oscar winning actor. It's all about the way you carry yourself, your mannerisms, or what I always called a person's physicality. For example, for my junkie character, I'd draw in my stomach real tight, like I'm having stomach cramps. And after that, I'd drop my shoulders real low, walk real fast, and pretend to be wiping sweat off my brow or cheeks every so often to add that real sense of authenticity. It was all in the stomach cramps, though. People saw you holding yourself like that, or if I looked like I was going to ask them for change or something, I became the invisible man. It was like my superpower. I saw everything and everyone, but no one saw me. No one except the other street junkies, and by the time I won those guys over, everything else just kind of fell into place. In as few words as possible, my role was intelligence gathering. I'd stay on the job for a few months at a time really living that lifestyle aside from all the dope and disease. And then I'd take a vacation, tell the junkies I was going to visit my parents out in the country, and then be back on the line again in like a week or two, refreshed, renewed. One of the first major things we accomplished as a task force was closing a violent gang assault case which was connected to the narcotics trade. Now, I won't go into details, but the whole thing was essentially a punishment for a missing package, and it sent shockwaves around the whole city, seeing as the victim was basically a civilian. It means a lot to everyone to send these jerks to federal prison, but little did we know that it would be what they called a Pyrrhic victory. 
Not long after we put these people in cuffs, the number of bodies being found around DC went up by 500% over the course of about a month, and as you can imagine, the chief of police wanted to know why. Officially speaking, all the deaths were coming up as overdoses, and some suspected a bad batch of heroin was to blame. But then some of the OD deaths were some veteran street junkies, and although junkies tend to be desperate sons of bitches, their vocation relies on them being street smart, not street stupid. And if they know that there's a bad batch going around, they try to isolate and avoid it. And by that, I mean find out who's selling it, and then avoid them till it's off the street. But some of the deaths were cats who should have easily known better. Junkies who had all kinds of ways of getting their hands on a fix without having to risk poisoning themselves. My point is, I knew something was wrong almost right away. Not just that there was some bad dope going around, I just had to figure out what. I started doing my usual rounds, not asking too many questions, just putting out feelers like I always did. And that's how I found out it wasn't coming from one particular corner or one particular dealer even, who might have stepped on his product so hard that he didn't mind a few dead addicts. It was coming from everywhere. People were avoiding one dealer thinking it was coming from them and then they dropped dead after spiking the bag that they got from their safe guy. Rumors were flying around, people were getting scared, and what's worse, they were getting sick from running out of dealers to turn to. We had four pharmacy robberies in one day. Four. And that's what I mean when I tell people that in a city like D.C., so any city really, everything is connected. And when that rot sets in, it's like mold. You need bleach to get it out, and at times... The BPD looked more like a dry wet wipe than a bottle of Clorox. Anyways, the part when I feel like I fell down was, unlike a lot of the other junkies who were avoiding their regular hookups in an effort to stay safe, I was hunting bags like it was the last batch of dope ever made. I wanted to find whoever was selling that bad dope and get them off the street. Locking junkies up is one thing, but... Letting them die off in their dozens every week was no part of my job description. Don't get me wrong, street addicts do each other pretty dirty, and you'll meet some real bad ones too. But I'd say around 40% are just good people who made terrible decisions, and some of them I might have even called friends in some other lifetime. And so, as I was saying, I was running around Deanwood, trying to find the source of this bad dope. But then, instead of being everywhere... It seemed to be nowhere all at once, and by that I mean everyone seemed to be able to get their hands on the bad dope when they weren't looking for it. But me, going out of my way to try and get my hands on it, I couldn't seem to find any at all. Every bag of dope I bought went straight into evidence and after the spike in drug deaths, every other bag was being tested for toxins and whatnot. Not a single one ever came up as hot, hot meaning fatally poisonous. So as you can imagine, I was starting to get pretty frustrated. Everyone seemed to be able to get their hands on that bad dope, except for me. At least until one day when I finally got my wish. So early one morning, I get myself onto the street and start doing my thing, putting out feelers and asking the junkies who's holding. Eventually, I get hooked up with the one guy I've been buying from, and we meet in our usual spot to make the exchange. But then... Instead of being there on foot or on bike, the delivery guy is in his car, and instead of just giving me the dope and taking the cash, he says something like, get in, we gotta go someplace to get it. I'm thinking, okay, this is out of the ordinary, but whatever, and I get in his car and off we go to get the product. We ended up in some trap house, which was to be expected, but what I didn't expect was to be given the bag of dope by someone you might call a lieutenant, i.e. someone who would never regularly involve themselves in direct sales. He didn't just hand me the stuff either. He asked me to sit down in the upstairs bedroom that doubled as their kind of office, and then I was subjected to what I can only describe as a minor interrogation. I didn't get the impression that they were looking for an undercover. It was all minor questions. What's your name? Where are you from? How long you been in D.C.? That kind of stuff. They wanted to know who I'd been buying from, who I thought had the best product, if I'd never been picked up by the cops. 
I answered everything as honestly as I could, even the question about being arrested. Me and the boys had faked one or two arrests while I'd been working, just to give me a little authenticity, so I brought up those times figuring that they could corroborate them if they asked the right people. They asked a few more questions, just seemingly basic stuff, and then after that, they gave me the bag and then told me to get lost. I asked them straight up if the stuff was safe and they said yeah, that it was like a new package and the old one was off the streets. I didn't take their word for it, and like everything else I bought, the bag went straight to evidence and then on to testing. Testing also takes time, a long time given the backlog of crap the lab has to test, so we didn't get the results until days, sometimes weeks after we sent off samples. Usually that kind of time scale worked for us, but on this occasion, it almost got me killed. The next morning was the same start as usual. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed by 7 a.m., out in the streets by 7.30. Everything went as normal. I did my usual thing, and then come early afternoon, I went to my usual spot outside a liquor store to beg for smokes from people coming out. It was part of a daily effort to establish presence in the area, and part of my routine was harassing the store owner for a free bottle or a free pack of smokes or anything. He never gave me anything, which was fine because I wouldn't be able to take it without catching hell from the higher ups, but it did big things for my character in terms of establishing that presence and authenticity. Every time I walked into that guy's store, it'd be a case of, you again, what the hell do you want now? And that's if he didn't open straight up with, get the hell out of my store, you crackhead. But that day, the day after the visit with the lieutenant, I walked into his store to have him address me by my street name. And the thing that really grabbed me was how he didn't know my street name. And if he knew my street name, that meant someone had been talking to him about me. But if that was the case, why was I being talked about? So the store owner calls me by my street name and right away my guard is up when he tells me that someone is looking for me. I'm posturing like I always did, asking who's looking for me in an aggressive way and adding things like, you tell whoever's looking for me that I'm right here. I ain't hiding. I'm right here. But then, instead of telling me who was looking for me, the store owner told me that someone had called into the store, as in on a cell phone, and asked for me by my street name. They asked the store owner if he had seen me and that when or if he did, he was to tell me to call him back, whoever he was. A lot of y'all might think that that's a little too vague to know who was calling, but you gotta understand something. None of my street contacts ever used a phone and neither did I. Or if I did, it was always a payphone. No true street junkie could get their hands on a cell phone and not try and sell it for drug money, so me having one would have been a dead giveaway that I was undercover. No one who knew me on the street would ever ask me to call them back, and if they did, there was no way that they wouldn't have left a number or a street address or something for me to head up. That meant that whoever wanted to talk to me was from the department, in which case it was probably important if it couldn't wait for the next debrief. I found the nearest payphone, I fished through my spare change to find enough for the call and then placed it directly to our office. I kept in character, used my street name, then the person who picked up passed the phone to the person who tried to contact me, and that's the proverbial crap hit the fan moment. As soon as he picks up the phone, he's like, Jody, you need to get your ass off the street and you need to do it fast. I ask him what the hell he's talking about and he says these five little words I don't think I'll ever forget. You should be dead already, he told me, and then repeated that I needed to bring my ass in before I got myself killed. It was like a movie or something. I'm asking him to tell me more and he says something like, there's no time, I'll explain later. Anyway... So we coordinate a pickup point, somewhere discreet that didn't involve me hiding in a goddamn dumpster like he'd only half-jokingly suggested. He shows up, I get in his car, and I'm goddamn furious because doing that completely burned my cover. I didn't see anyone see me get in, but that doesn't matter in undercover work. You always assume someone's watching. You either go total immersion, or you might as well assume that your cover's been burned. And for me... There's no in-between, so, as I said, the moment I stepped in my co-worker's car, 
years of work went to crap in the time it took me to buckle up. I told him that he better have a damn good explanation for pulling me out like that, but boy did he ever. We didn't know it at the time, but narcotics had a mic in the apartment I'd been questioned the day before, and that's how we learned that the baggie had been sold contained what we like to call a hot shot. A hot shot is basically drugs that have been tampered with so that instead of getting you high, they kill you. And following the gang assault arrest, the dealer somehow got wind that one of the street junkies was an undercover cop. In other words, they knew I was there, they just didn't know who I was. And so someone had the bright idea to load up a bunch of hot shots and sell them to whatever street junkie they suspected of being the undercover. They must have murdered at least 50 junkies by poisoning before they finally found out it was me, and the way they did it was kind of genius. They were so effective in murdering their suspected undercovers because no junkie on the planet doesn't shoot up or snort the dope they just bought. So if I bought the bag and I was still alive, that was because I hadn't taken the dope I bought from them, and the only reason I wouldn't do that is because I was an undercover cop. The surveillance team heard the dealers put a green light on me with their own ears. They used my cover name and everything. They heard how I must have been an undercover because I clearly hadn't taken the hot shot they'd given me, and at the time I was picked up, there must have been like a hundred little hoppers running around with pistols in their waistbands, just hoping to run into me so they could ice me and enjoy the reputation boost associated with that. And what I'm trying to say is, I should not be alive right now. To outsiders, it seems like the system worked. Surveillance heard my cover name, got in touch with the boss, and then that started the frantic effort to get a hold of me before I ended up with several bullet holes in my face. But the probability of that all happening exactly as it should, it's like winning the lottery of life. Surveillance didn't know my cover name, so if the dealers hadn't talked the whole thing out and explained exactly why they knew that I was undercover, the call wouldn't get made. If I didn't stop by the store for some reason at that exact time, the call doesn't get heard and I'm dead within an hour. I could have got shot on my way to the pickup, shot as I was getting into the car. I'd gone over it in my head like a thousand times and in every scenario, I don't make it out alive. But then somehow, by the grace of God Almighty, I made it out of there. And I'm not a religious person. And I kind of admire people that do have faith, but... After some of the crap I've seen, I can't bring myself to share it, no matter how hard I try. And that's why I don't talk about guardian angels or any of that stuff, and I talk about the lottery. I don't need to believe in angels to appreciate how awesome, literally awesome it is. Everything fell right into place for me. That circumstance and coincidence aligned and saved my life. I know my angels. I met them. They're my co-workers, and I owe them everything. What I'm about to tell you is probably the single craziest thing that's ever happened to me. If there was one event from my life that I think transcends just being a personal experience and would make a good movie or short film or something, it's this. So... Back in 2012, I used to work at a card shop here in Pittsburgh. We weren't like a greetings card store though. We bought and sold trading card games or TCGs. I'm talking about things like Pokemon cards, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic the Gathering, stuff like that. As part of our jobs, we were very active in online message boards related to various trading card games, especially when it came to buying, selling, and trading threads. We did a lot of business using those message boards and... They were also where we got all our news regarding updates and new releases for the various TCGs that we dealt in. And so, one day, I roll into the shop to find my boss and a co-worker sat in the office in just complete silence. They were just staring at the office's computer screen, all this wall of text that had been posted on one of the TCG message boards, and when I asked them what the deal was, they gave me the TLDR. One of the largest collections of Yu-Gi-Oh cards in the entire United States had been stolen from its owner, and according to the post on the message board, 
the robbery itself had been absolutely terrible. Two guys in ski masks broke into the collector's house, tied him up at gunpoint, and then tortured him until he gave up his cards. The collector had all of his rarest and most valuable cards locked up in a safe and had his less valuable collection on display. But then instead of just grabbing binders full of cards, the robbers seemed to know that the more valuable ones would be locked away somewhere, almost like they had inside knowledge of this collector's habits. The guy ended up in the hospital and had to have an emergency transfusion from all the blood that he'd lost. I think he tried to hold out and talk them into taking the less valuable cards or something, but they knew that they just had to burn him or cut him a little more and he'd eventually give up the goods. And they were right too. The message board post went on to say that literally thousands of dollars worth of cards had been stolen from this guy and basically warned every collector and dealer on the east coast to watch their backs and be on the lookout for this dude's stolen collection. As you can imagine, we were all pretty shocked. I mean, it's actually not all that uncommon for thefts to occur in the TCG community. We just never heard of anything on that kind of scale. To have targeted a big collector like that, in a way that suggested some pretty in-depth planning, and that was spooky all on its own. But then to have tortured them, it was very chilling. And not nearly as chilling as the following day when we had a very unusual looking visitor stop by our store. I wasn't actually working that shift, but my boss told me the story later. It was a weekday afternoon, so the store was basically empty aside from one of our regulars when a very unusual looking customer stopped by. Speaking of regulars, we made most of our money from a very small core group of customers. Occasionally, some random kid and a parent would stop by to take a look at some starter decks from Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh!, and if it was a first-time visit for most other folks, they usually fit one of several nerdy archetypes. But the day after we heard about the collector getting robbed, the person who walked into our shop did not have the look of your average TCG enthusiast. My boss said the guy looked like he was a mechanic or something. I saw the security camera footage myself, and he pretty much nailed it. From what I could tell... The guy had dirty overalls on with a pair of sunglasses covering his eyes and he had short reddish brown hair. The guy walks up to the counter holding nothing but a thin plastic bag, puts it on the counter and tells my boss that he's got some cards to sell. My boss is a savvy guy so instead of asking him anything too direct, he asks the overalls guy how long he's been collecting as a form of non-confrontational information gathering. The guy replied that he wasn't a collector, and that he'd inherited the cars from his brother following his untimely passing. My boss shares his condolences, and then the guy adds that he was trying to get some cash together to pay for his brother's funeral, so he figured that he'd stop by to see if the cards were worth anything. My boss promises to pay him a fair price for anything we could flip, and then opens up the bag to check out what the guy had brought in. My boss said the second he opened the bag, his jaw dropped. Inside were a mix of extremely rare Yu-Gi-Oh cards, protected by a mixture of soft sleeves and hard plastic top loaders. There was a Cyber Stein card, a Dark Paladin card, two Black Luster soldiers, and a Chaos Emperor dragon, just to name a few. And these constituted some of the rarest cards on the market at the time. But strewn among them, my boss starts spotting the likes of a High Priestess of Prophecy card, a number 11 Big Eye, and a Spellbook of Judgment. These were cards that had only been released just months before, and not all in the same set, meaning someone had gone to great lengths and potentially spent a lot of money to be able to secure them all so fast. My boss then started thinking how the guy's dead brother must have been a pretty serious collector, so, in the most polite and respectful way possible, he asked the guy what his brother's name was, since he might have been one of our regulars while he was still with us. The guy dropped a name my boss didn't recognize and then mentioned something about how he wasn't from the area. And that is when my boss starts to realize something. The Yu-Gi-Oh! collector that had been robbed just the previous week lived across state lines in Ohio, somewhere outside of Cleveland, I think, but don't quote me on that. 
Anyways, my boss starts thinking, if he robs some Yu-Gi-Oh collector, the smart thing to do would be to drive across state lines to stay one step ahead of law enforcement. He then starts to realize that a lot of the cards the guy had brought in that day were the exact same kind that had been stolen from the collector, particularly cards like Madolce Queen Tiramisu. Then slowly but surely, he figures out that the story about this guy's brother suddenly passing away was just that, a story. My boss, being the guy that he was, lowers his voice and then tells the mechanic-looking dude something like, Look, I'm going to be honest with you, buddy. These cards are worth a heck of a lot of money. A lot more than what we got in store right now, but if you give me until Friday, I can scrape together $5,000 in exchange for every card in that bag. Does that sound like a fair deal? And the guy smiles, nods his head, and then my boss asks for a name and cell number just in case he needed to contact him. The guy says his name was Ricky, and then gave him some excuse about how he was between cell phones or whatever, but that he'd 100% stop by Friday afternoon to make the sale if we were still down. My boss then shakes the guy's hand, kind of jokingly makes him a promise to come back on the Friday, and then watches him walk out of the shop. He said the next few minutes were pretty surreal. He went back to his computer and reread the post about the collector getting robbed, which I think was written by one of this dude's Yu-Gi-Oh buddies since the collector himself was in the hospital. I saw that big wall of text for myself, and I also saw how it included a pretty comprehensive list of what had been stolen. Presumably, it had already been put together for the benefit of the cops, but it also meant my boss could check the list to make sure it all lined up with what was in the bag. Every card that was in that bag was also on the list of stolen from the collector. Every. Single. One. So what does my boss do? He calls the cops. The officer he spoke to knew nothing about the robbery over in Ohio, so the first thing my boss does is fill him in on the whole backstory. The officer makes sure to get a description of the mechanic-looking guy and asks a few other routine questions, but then my boss informs him of the whole come back on Friday thing. He said there was a pause on the line before the cop asked him and what sounded like disbelief. You arrange for this guy to return to the store? Which he had, with the promise of five grand. The officer then tells my boss that he has to make a few phone calls, but that he'd be in touch by the following morning at the very latest. But then, a few hours later, the cop calls back to tell our boss that he was about to receive a phone call from two major crimes detectives who had just been in touch with their counterparts over in Ohio. Basically, our store was about to become the center of an interstate sting operation, and so as not to blow the cop's cover, we had to go over a few things with them so we could play our part correctly. And it was also around about that time that I learned that I'd be working the day of the sting. And so finally, on the Friday morning, I show up to work to find two random kids sitting in the manager's office. And I do mean two random kids, too. They looked to be high school seniors at the most, but the second I asked who they were, they each flashed me a shiny badge that read State Police. And both cops were in their 20s, and thanks to a fresh shave and some loose hoodies and a few very real late-stage pimples, they looked like the kind of guys that belonged in a TCG store. And before we opened, we went over a few final details, and essentially we were to simply go about our regular duties, and if the suspect showed up, we were to make the sale as planned. Under no circumstances were we to try to get involved in any shape or form, and when the cops made their move, we were to retreat back into the store until it was safe to come out again. No citizen's arrests, no heroics whatsoever. And that was fine by us, I mean, the dude had already tortured someone half to death, and as the cops explained, probably had someone waiting for him in a getaway car since it was two suspects that committed the torture slash home invasion, not just one. Anyway, the whole morning, the cops were basically hanging out across the street from the store, then right around the early afternoon, they came into the store to start doing their thing, which was basically acting like a pair of very indecisive customers. They stayed for a few hours too, 
The suspect didn't show up until around 3.30, so they were pacing back and forth, just hanging out, talking to us about our jobs and the card games and stuff like that. We close at 5.30, so by the time 3.30 rolled around, we were starting to wonder if the guy was going to show at all. And then out of the blue, in walks the suspect, dressed in those same dirty overalls wearing the same pair of shades. It got real tense for a few minutes as my boss looked through the cards, then when he was done, he essentially gave the two undercovers the go-ahead. I was already stood back near the office trying to look inconspicuous when my boss said, Hey, thanks for bringing these in, buddy. Uh, let me head back to the office there and get you your cash. Then, right as we're walking into the office, intent on closing and locking the door behind us, we just heard, State Police. Let me see your hands. We watched the security camera monitors in the office as the two baby-faced cops approached the suspect with their guns drawn. He didn't even try to escape or put up a fight. He did exactly as he was told, got on his knees, and then they put him on the ground and put the cuffs on him. It was a huge relief for us because we'd very briefly discussed the possibility of a shootout happening, in which case we just have to hit the deck in the office and pray nothing went through a wall. But the arrest itself was actually kind of quick and boring. The guy just did as they said, and I guess because he was so stunned that he'd been bamboozled like that, he just saw these two nerds when he walked in, and then the next, they're yelling at him with guns drawn, saying that they'll shoot him if he even dares to fart. I guess if it were made into a movie, that scene might be a little bit more intense, but like I said, we were super relieved that the situation remained relatively calm. Back in 2014, my family and I moved out of Manhattan and up near this little place called Batavia, which is about halfway between Rochester and Buffalo. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of the move, just the one most relevant to the story, and that's how the worst part about moving was losing my bar. So I went to the same place to watch them Yankees for over eight years, so not being able to stop by whenever I wanted felt like losing a limb. I could drive into the city, maybe take the train if I wanted to visit and have a few beers, but what I really needed to do was find a new booze trap for me to watch sports at, and one that was within walking distance. I ended up having to settle on cycling distance instead, which ended up me riding home drunk more than a few times, but in the end, I found this little place called Johnny's Bar that I could ride out to, with all the same local spot feels my old bar had, just with much cheaper beer. And who needs familiar faces when you got three bottles of Bud? Now anyways, I start heading over to this place on game nights just to check it out. The first couple of times were kind of awkward. The people in Johnny's weren't rude, just a little insular, I guess. So it took a few visits for them to really warm up to me. I think Johnny saw the same six faces night in and night out for the better part of two decades. And one of these faces was at the end of the bar there, almost every single time I visited. I didn't really notice just how frequently this guy was there until one Wednesday afternoon when I took a half day at work after a fight with the old ball and chain there. It wasn't anything too vicious and we kissed and made up by bedtime but after slamming the phone down on her at work I took that half day then rode my bike over to Johnny's to get a beer. And there he was, propping up at the end of the bar, the only other guy in the place. And he's skinny as a rake, balding a little on top with gin blossoms all over his nose and cheeks, and all he's doing is sitting there, a glass of liquor in front of him, watching the ash of his butt slowly burn down. And I didn't say anything to him at first, just said hi to the bartender and ordered a beer, and then seeing as it's the great unifier, got to talking about how the wife was giving me grief back at home. And then while I'm doing that, I start trying to get our quiet, skinny friend into the conversation. I guess I'm gregarious like that, not wanting to make anyone feel left out, but almost the second after I turned to the guy to basically be like, Women, am I right, buddy? The bartender very subtly raises a hand and shakes his head, as if to say, Don't bother. I didn't want to offend the guy or anything, so 
I offered up a little apology to the bartender, just by way of politeness, and then carried on the conversation with him alone. At one point, the bartender goes over to the skinny guy, pours him another liquor, and then a second after turning his back, the skinny guy downs the drink and then just says, another one, in a way that was so flat it kind of came off as rude. I figured Skinny and the bartender must have known each other pretty goddamn well if he'd take that kind of talk without comment. And that or something really crappy had just happened to this guy which was why I'd been told to leave him alone. The bartender then walks back over to him but instead of pouring him another drink, he puts the whole bottle in front of him and says that he'll just add whatever he drinks to his tab. The Skinny returns a nod in thanks and then over the half hour or so he finishes the whole bottle that almost falls off of his stool when it came time to leave. He's only just about made it out the door before he sort of steadied himself and took a deep breath and started off down the grass verge towards wherever he lived at. I waited until the guy was 100% out of listening range and then I asked the bartender a question in about as diplomatic a fashion as possible, and that question being, what the hell is that guy's problem? The bartender sighed and then just stared off at nothing for a second like he was weighing up whether or not to tell me, but I think in reality it was more like he was wondering how much he should tell me, and I guess he settled on this. The skinny drunk at the end of the bar, whose name I don't really want to give away, used to be an undercover cop. As soon as the bartender said that, I thought to myself, well, that explains that. I mean, the guy had probably been in some pretty hairy situations, right? We've all seen the movies. Probably had to do a few bumps of blow with a gun in his face or something. Terrified his targets are going to find the wire strapped to his ball sack. But no, this guy wasn't that kind of undercover. He never dressed up or worked on his character like some kind of crazy method actor. He did all of his undercover work from the comfort of some air-conditioned office over in Albany. He didn't physically infiltrate any of the groups that he'd helped bring down. Instead, he did it online. I kind of went from thinking, well, that explains the hardcore day drinking, to how does this guy have advanced PTSD from sending a few emails? But that right there, ladies and gentlemen, demonstrates the sheer vastness of my own ignorance. Because our former undercover cop wasn't busting dorm room pot dealers at NYU or Columbia. No, his job was to infiltrate online pedo rings by posing as someone who shared their disgusting inclinations. From what the bartender said, and to be fair, I've heard this a few places too, undercovers are only supposed to be on the front line for a limited amount of time, what with it being such a high-stress position. Every couple of months, you swap your team out for a fresh one and let the spent one rest up and decompress so they're ready to do it all over again. But then, when it came to all the online creepy stuff, things worked slightly different. In regular undercover work, you can't overuse your assets. You can't have one guy who was some meth-slinging biker five minutes ago pop up as some mafia associate in the same city just a few weeks later. A lot of the time, when an undercover operation finishes up, you can't use the same people again, especially once criminals start figuring out that there was a rat that they should have been smelling. Only with the online stuff, if your undercover had to burn a profile, they can make up another one in a matter of minutes. Definitely not a cop 69 became swear I'm not 50420, and then we're back on the job cracking into all those evil websites and bringing them down. They still rested their guys every so often, but it wasn't like they needed to constantly cycle officers around to maintain their covers, and on top of that, that skinny bar fly there was relentless. I don't know if he had some kind of savior complex or if he just knew how good at his job he was, but time and time again, Skinny refuses to go on leave or take any kind of break. He goes back into the meat grinder over and over boom, 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 uncovering these freaks left and right through gaining their trust, maybe even their friendship, and then getting them to share any material that they had stashed away. Getting them to admit that they were pedos wasn't enough either. 
you can't just arrest and throw someone in jail just because they said something gross, or at least things don't work that way as far as I know. To get an arrest and a conviction, Skinny had to convince these guys to send them whatever child exploitation pictures they had, and he had to actually look at all this stuff too to make sure it was legitimate, and then another bunch of cops went about tracking down both the victims and the perps. And so, that was Skinny's job, seeing those pictures and talking to those guys, and he did it for years, taking only the odd piece of vacation time here and there so he didn't completely burn himself out. And I guess he was obsessed, but then, who wouldn't be? You're taking these scumbags out. But there's still just so many more of them, and every day you take off is one that they're free to carry on doing all their evilness. And I'm not saying I know exactly what this guy was thinking, but that's just my best guess at why he works so relentlessly. And then one day, I guess things just got the better of old Skinny there, and he turns in his badge and just vanishes off the face of the earth. It wasn't actually Skinny who told the bartender all that stuff about him either. Apparently he just showed up one day, ordered himself a drink, and then kept on knocking him back until the cows came home. Next day he shows up, does the same thing all over again. And then aside from the odd vacation that he gave his liver, that guy was in there almost every day, day in and day out, doing his respectable impression of Nicolas Cage in that Leaving Las Vegas movie. You know the one where the guy drinks himself half to death before someone pulls him out of it. Now anyway, several months go by, and then some stranger comes into Johnny's bar with a picture of Skinny, asking if anyone's seen him. Skinny wasn't there at the time, and everyone was all tight-lipped and first wondering who this guy was, and what does he want with him. The stranger then pulls out a police badge, but instead of appealing to authority, the guy appeals to the patron's sense of common decency, he explains that Skinny was an ex-co-worker of his at the state police, that he just disappeared after quitting on them, and that he and his old buddies had been trying to track him down for the better part of six months. He explains how he thought that Skinny's drinking was out of control, how they'd been worried he'd driven his car off the Five Arches Bridge or something, and how they just wanted to check in on him to see how he was doing. I think the goal was to get Skinny on the wagon, but by the evidence of my own two eyes, after seeing him nearly faceplant after climbing off that bar stool, I can safely say that their efforts were in vain. The bartender then told me that that's all Skinny ever seemed to do. Stop by, talk to no one, get drunk, and then leave. And he did it. Because all he wanted in the world was to forget about the things that he'd seen, and the things that he'd said, trying to land those child predator scumbags in jail where they belonged. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday and Thursday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays and Wednesday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, or send it over email and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for members of the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, a dry dude wipe or a bottle of Clorox.